Um, I am uh, Nivedita and um, I'm Sriharri. And uh, today we're going to talk about our experience in uh, building an experimentation platform in Tojo. Um, so we are both from uh, Nilenso, and Nilenso is um, a software cooperative uh, based in Bangalore. So uh, over the last over the last year and a half, uh, we have worked with a subsidiary of Staples called Staple Sparks. Uh, which uses uh, machine learning, predictive modeling, and other distributed uh, uh, systems to make niche products for staples. What we have built with them is a multivariate testing platform which serves all of experimentation's needs of staples through one box. These are some magnitude of data and uh, sessions to give you an idea and perspective for the rest of the talk. Uh, we have a very strict SLA of uh, 99.9 percentile at 10 milliseconds, uh, as we sit synchronously between all requests that goes to staples.com. So um, here is roughly what you'll take away from this talk. Um, you'll learn about uh, various ways in which you can set up your experiments. Um, you'll learn that traffic is precious. I've said it once now, um, and how to use it efficiently. Um, and You'll learn some like nice things about Clojure, and you'll see some really good examples. Um, and you'll also see that um, you can build nice, beautiful assembly lines using Clojure, something that we should do more of. And you'll also see how um, you can test a complex system using simulation testing. So this, is, this would be the overall structure of the talk. Uh, we'll spend some time explaining in brief the domain of experimentation especially in context of the app we have built. Uh, then we'll go into the implementation details of the app, and then we'll talk about how we tested the app using simulation testing. Uh, so the first portion of the talk, uh, the domain itself, science. Uh, so the scientific method has been in use by humans since the 17th century, where we propose a hypothesis, test it, do some measurements around it, and then based on the measurements that we did during an experiment on that hypothesis, we say the hypothesis was correct or incorrect. Experimentation is a step in the scientific method which lets us prove, uh, compare two competing hypotheses. So for example, the most common example would be a vaccine trial where you could divide your target population into two groups of control group and treatment group, where the control group doesn't get any vaccine or gets a vaccine that is already there in the market, and the treat test group would get, get the vaccine that you're trying to put in the market. So then, after a certain period of time, you would compare the treat test group against the control group to see how effective the vaccine has been. Um, so historically, experimentation has been used extensively in, say, uh, medicine or genetics, but more recently, we are doing this to businesses, right? Uh, we are evaluating business ideas um, against each other, and we want to compare, say, which one is better than the other. And um, the basic underlying um, fact is that we use hard data to make decisions. And by, by experiment, we mean control experiment specifically. Um, so we'll go through a few basic terms before we jump into the details of experiment infrastructure. Um, but say, something like a hypothesis, right? Like, um, a term like a hypothesis can do some explanation. Uh, it can be as simple as, say, on the web, um, a red button is more compelling than a blue button, or uh, the other way. Um, you can also say uh, that one model uh, for um, like making an offer to a user is more effective than another model. Or, say, you can even um, evaluate entire products, like, say, uh, I've been using an email service for five years, and I want to test a new one, but I'm not sure which one to use. Um, but like, you can use experiments to make your decision, um, and like, say, even like you're comparing different coupon services or something. Another such uh, keyword uh, that we'd use a lot is treatment, and uh, we colloquially refer to it as a bucket. Uh, and we'd use this. Uh, we will be using this interchangeably through the talk. Um, so a treatment is basically like the value for a variable in your system, right? Like imagine your uh, red-blue experiment. Um, so the color is the variable, and the values red or blue uh, would be the treatment. And typically what you have in, uh, in an experiment is a control, 
uh, treatment and a test treatment. So control is effectively no treatment, and test is uh, your hypothesis. And there's no uh, need for uh, your experiment to be restricted to only two treatment, two treatments. You can have as many treatments as you want, say red, blue, green. Another term we would we use is uh, coverage. So, for example, uh, you're testing a, a recommendation engine using our experimentation platform. And we tell the recommendation engine, yes, give a recommendation on this product. But when they try and apply this uh, treatment on real time, they figure out that the product that they're giving recommendation on is actually out of stock. So they can't really give this recommendation. So they didn't, do not confirm that treatment with us. What they do is, uh, so that particular session or that particular user for which the recommendation was being given should not be uh, considered part of the experiment. So when we are measuring the experiment's success, we should, not we should not say that the purchase made by that user was because of the recommendation that we said we should give, because we did not really show it. So coverage of a uh, treatment is very fundamental in ensuring the precise measurement of an experiment. What we do in our system is by design, we assume every treatment that we give out to our clients will not be shown. So there's an explicit acknowledgement or explicit confirmation required from the client side Maybe the client says that I have applied the treatment that you have provided, so please consider this particular user, this particular session as part of the experiment. And it's uh, quite fundamental because, um, say, in, in our case, say only 10% of the actual traffic is covered, so it really skews your metrics if you're uh, not uh, looking at coverage. Um, so here are, for example, the sequence of interactions. Like I'm not getting to any, we are not getting to any closure yet, but there's lots coming. So just like, the domain is kind of heavy. So like, uh, we want to get through those parts before we show you the closure so that it's actually meaningful. Um, so here is, for example, the sequence of interactions that uh, you and I will have. Say you're um, the client of the experimentation platform. Say I'm the experimentation platform. So first you say, oh, uh, there's a new user. Uh, here is uh, the user, or here is what the session ID of the user is. Uh, and then I'm like, okay. And then you're like, give me the treatments for, for this guy. And say, I want the checkout page while I experiment, and I want uh, the red blue experiment. And then I give you the buckets for that guy. And then you're like, oh, I actually showed the button to this guy. And then you're like, you tell me that you showed it. And that's the confirmed treatment call. And then you're like, this guy did something interesting. So he's like, he made a purchase or something. And you want to let me. Um, know that this thing happened because you later want to measure against it, right? Like you want to say uh, how many sales dollars has this thing made over the other or what's the margin uh, or something like that. Uh, so now we'll go through the basic infrastructure, experiment infrastructure. Uh, the most basic of an experiment can be where you have one experiment and you have two treatments under it, control and test. And uh, you divide your user or the traffic that comes to your system into these two uh, buckets. And then uh, control can be essentially no treatment and test will be uh, the hypothesis that you're trying to test. And then you run your experiment for a certain period of time and then you compare the measurements of test against control. In this case, traffic is split between control and test only. And like we said before, it's not restricted to only two. So you can have as many treatments as you want, but uh, note that the traffic is split between them. Um, and then you're free to compare as many treatments as you want. So you can compare control against test one or control against test two or even test one against test two. So once you've set up your experiment, you want to run multiple experiments at the same time. One way to do this would be to share traffic between them. This would be the messy way of running. We have, actually, the term messy is not really used in Literature. the domain. We have used it because So uh, you share the traffic between uh, two experiments that you're running parallelly. So a user which comes into your system can be part of both experiment one and experiment two. This type of experiment setup is useful when you're trying to test two orthogonal hypotheses. For example, if you have an experiment running on the home page of your system and on the checkout page of your system, you know that the user will not be affected by these two experiments. Uh, uh, these two experiments. So the measure measurement of experiment one will not be affected by experiment two. So hence the orthogonal hypothesis. So another way you can run experiments at the same time is by splitting the traffic between them. And uh, you do this normally when uh, you want to size measurements in each experiment. Um, a silly example would be, say, uh, you're doing some experiments on your checkout page. 
and you've changed both the typeface and the button color. Okay, and then you say, you're not really sure um, if the typeface is more compelling or the button is more compelling, um, but you want to make sure that whatever decisions you make, it's well informed and precise. So what you do is you run them with split traffic, so a person who sees the typeface change will never see the button change and vice versa. And, um, and that's it, you'll see that the traffic is split at all places, so this is quite expensive. So this is the first setup we went into production uh, with in our experimentation platform where we allowed a client to run both messy experiments and uh, precise experiments at the same time. The way we did this, we would split the traffic uh, at the top level into, a, into precise and messy and the portions of traffic uh, that go into precise will be split into other precise, traffic, other precise experiments and the portion of traffic that go into messy will become part of all the experiments, uh, which can potentially become part of all the, all the messy experiments. So yeah, this is the first version we went into production with. Um, after we were in production for a couple of months, we realized this one important lesson that traffic is precious. Splitting of traffic at every level on every experiment become, makes it very hard to make uh, measurements, like uh, check the, see the performance of the experiment in a very uh, quick manner. So for example, for us, it took four weeks of running an experiment with 100% traffic, 100% of staples traffic, to get any st statistical significant data for that particular experiment, which was pretty expensive because we wanted to run, we wanted quick feedback loop, we wanted to run experiments on, uh, on, the, on smaller portions of traffic in a more uh, uh, finer, granular manner. And this is not only true for uh, staples, right? Actually, like, for example, Google also says the exact same things. And this next model that we went to production with um, is actually something that's inspired by Google's paper. And we are calling it the nested or the layered model, um, wherein it's basically a tree, right? So this structure gives us all the benefits that we would get from the precise and messy model, except that it gives us finer control over traffic. So we can uh, restrict the traffic for an experiment um, with exactly the kind of traffic, the kind of people that we want to put into that experiment. And how we have done the nesting is that an experiment can be nested under the bucket of another experiment. So to give you a more um, illustrative example, I'm sorry, the colors have um, really gone out, but um, so you have, like say, three experiments at the top level, check out Super Labs and search, right? Um, and Super Labs is, say, your fictitious experiment, right? So what you want to do is, say, compare the world of mutants, and you want to compare them against the world of mutants, right? So that's your top-level division right there. And, say, in the world of mutants, you want to compare uh, the powers of adamantium, and, say, you want to compare it against, uh, or, like, you also want to uh, test the powers of telepathy, right? So what you do is you run them parallelly, and that's no split of traffic, so adamantium and telepathy are running parallelly. And within adamantium, you want to test the powers of adamantium in, um, say, in Wolverine's bones, or say, in Ultron's shell, right? So at this point, you want to ensure that your measurement is precise, and hence you split the traffic between them. And uh, because it's uh, split, it's not split between adamantium and telepathy, say if I'm uh, in the world of mutants and I'm being experimented on, uh, then I can be like uh, a Jean Grey with Wolverine's bones, or like a Professor X with uh, Wolverine's bone, all, uh, or Ultron's shell, right? And what I can also do with this model is that if I want to run an experiment on all the Wolverines, I can do that and I can restrict, to, and restrict it to only the Wolverines, right? And this is something that I could never fathom doing in the older model. Um, this is the, the same setup the pre in the previous slide uh, using a different visualization, a layered visualization, which is used by the Google uh, overlapping in experiments infrastructure paper. So uh, this is same model, uh, but cut into layers. Each layer is orthogonal to each other again. So traffic is essentially shared between each layer of experiment. Uh, a traffic slice through a layer is essentially given the same treatment. So. Uh, in this case, uh, if I slice my traffic from here, every, every person in that traffic slice will get a mutant's treatment. And every, if, I, if I slice my traffic from here, every person in that traffic slice will get claw, wolverine, and uh, gene gray uh, treatment. 
treatment. The interesting part here is that immutants is a shared control group for all the mutants. So I can compare Wolverine to immutants, I can compare Ultron to immutants, and I can compare all the mutants together with immutants. So here you can clearly see that this is a shared uh, control for all these experiments running, which is done in, uh, wow, the colors are not really visible at all, but I'll use the pointer, uh, which is done in our structure by using a shared bucket. This essentially is supposed to be a different color from the rest. Uh, this is the shared immutants bucket, which can be which can be compared against these buckets, uh, these Wolverine, Ultron, uh, Jean Grey, and Professor X. If we did not have a concept of shared bucket, we would have to sacrifice some traffic here under adamantium to have a control group for Wolverine to compare them uh, to compare Wolverine to immutants. So, to uh, because again, traffic is precious. We can't split traffic at every single level. So that's when again shared con shared buckets uh, help us. You make use of uh, traffic efficiency. So um, another one of the things that is quite vital to any experimentation platform is um, to basically null test, right? So an AA test is is that it helps you um, remove uh, the possibility of the null hypothesis. So uh, what it does is basically compare a treatment against itself, right? So you have an A bucket, say, and you're dividing it into A1 and A2. That's basically the same traffic, but it's getting split. And what it helps you do is um, that, for example, uh, there is some randomness, right? You, you want to ensure that the treatment is responsible for your measurements and not just some randomness. So you know that when, they, like, say, reports on A1 and A2 are sort of similar, you know that you have attained statistical significance uh, in the traffic. And what it also helps you do is um, test the experimentation platform itself in that we don't have any bias in the way we are bucketing users. So, uh, Let us know if that's not, is that legible? Can people read that? Sorry, there's something wrong with the, the converter. So um, the most frequent question we are, people ask us when we explain the thing that we're building is, uh, why not use a third party app, uh, which is out there like Kissmetrics or Optimizely or any other such app? So we have we've thought about that, and there are reasons why we can't use them or why we wanted to build it ourselves. So we wanted to be able to run uh, multiple experiments over the traffic that comes into our system, but not only that, we wanted to, we wanted to have a final gain control over how the traffic flows over all our experiment uh, through all our experiments. Second, our platform is very e-commerce opinionated. The data we collect and the, the metrics we report on are our metrics like margin, conversion, and sales dollars, which again is like our system is very uh, built to measure these metrics in a, in a very good way. Uh, we really needed low latency because again, if you go to staples.com right now and search for a product, staples.com is asking us which search, search algorithm should I use for g doing this search and then giving you the result. So we're sitting in every single request that goes to staples.com and that's why we need to be uh, very fast. Uh, we needed real-time reports because uh, that's the thing people want. They want to see the, the performance of the experiments that they're running uh, as they're running it, not after two months or not after a certain period of time. Uh, we wanted to have uh, this feature called controlled ramp-ups of experiments. So if you're running a risky experiment, uh, a new model that our data scientists come up, came up with, which, is, which they're not sure of how it will actually work in the real world, so you don't want to assign 100% traffic or a huge chunk of your traffic. You don't want to expose a huge chunk of your traffic to that experiment, to that risky experiment. So you start with a very small amount of traffic. Start with 10%, start with 5%. And then as the time goes by, as, as you get the feedback from that, you, using our real-time reports, as you get feedback on that experiment, you increase the in amount of traffic that goes through it. And through that increase, through the ramp up of the traffic, you want to ensure stickiness. That is also an important thing to be learned, that as you're changing the traffic uh, that goes through the experiment, you want to ensure that if a person that had, if, if, if a person that had received one treatment in the beginning of the experiment should receive the same treatment till the end of the experiment. Uh, layered experiments, and we wanted statistically sound data, which can be audited by our data, data scientists and other people. 
And again, uh, we wanted to build a system that can be very deeply integrated with other systems in our client's ecosystem so that we can leverage uh, the, function, the, the data from other systems as well in addition to the data that we collect. Um, we're calling the slide Parantu because we didn't really come up with another better word. Uh, that basically means, but, watch out for these things. Um, so if you do decide to build something like this by yourself, um, you need to understand that it's quite complex. You'll have to read thick statistics books. And the fields is like uh, in the experimental, in the research phase for the finer details. And you will have to read some white papers to understand a few things better. And um, it's a significant investment of time, right? Like um, if Google, uh, Netflix, or Microsoft are any examples, it takes them years to build this. It has taken us years to build this and years to get right. So uh, understand that it's, it's a big undertaking. And um, for all you know, what you need is a third party service that gives you um, like quick access and you just want to get, get it up and running. And um, you should try it out before you're sure that you want something like this. And of course, we didn't build it ourselves. We had a team of statisticians there to help us. Um, the next section is the implementation detail of um, the system that we built. So this is the sort of the overall structure of the system. Uh, it's not very complex, but there are four major parts to this uh, system. The API service, the reporting service, uh, I have to point it. Uh, the Postgres cluster, and uh, the ETL service. Uh, we'll go into a little more detail with each of these things in a bit, but uh, in, it, as a brief explanation, the API service is the one that serves all the client's runtime uh, needs, where they start a session with us, they ask us for treatments, we give them treatments, they, uh, they confirm a treatment, they record events saying purchase has happened, all that happens here. Uh, this is the portion where uh, they set up an experiment and, um, and, and the scheduling of the experiment and all that, and, uh, and they report on the experiment. Uh, the cluster is the, essentially the state of all our functionally written code. Uh, so we have actually, uh, we maintain a Postgres cluster ourselves, where we have one master, one master and uh, three standbys. Uh, one of the standbys acts as a reporting DB. Um, we'll talk about it in, in a bit. Uh, then we have an ETL service, which again is written in Clojure, which talks to uh, Redshift uh, and our API service. So uh, in the API service, uh, one of the more interesting parts is how we bucket users, right? And here's a simplified version of that, uh, and I'll walk through this really quickly. So what this is, is basically a tree traversal. So we walk the tree breadth first, and like for each level of experiments, for each experiment, we bucket you. And the way we bucket you is ensure that if you have been given a bucket before, we give that back to you. And that's on multiple levels, right? Like during this session, on that device, on that group of devices, we ensure that you get the same treatment. Um, and if you haven't been uh, assigned to this experiment before, we roll a fair die and uh, put you into one of these treatments and give that back to you. So the Postgres cluster we talked about, again, this is a functional conf. I don't want to go into details of it. But uh, since ours, ours is a very data-centered domain, we wanted to ensure that the data that we save has integrity and we don't lose a lot of data. So we need a very quick failover mechanism if our database crashes. We need a very quick way of making sure that another database comes up in, in place of it and we're able to write to it. Uh, so we, since we were, use, we were using Postgres as our uh, runtime database, because again, it's awesome, uh, as a OLTP database at least, uh, uh, we, there was no out of the box uh, Postgres cluster management uh, tool out there which we could use. Uh, RDS at that point did not have read replicas for Postgres when we started building this thing. And even with RDS, I don't think there's a uh, failover mechanism in place. Uh, so we built it ourselves using a tool called Rep Manager, which Second Quadrant uh, built and maintains. Uh, it's an open source tool. Uh, so what it does is uh, you essentially have a cluster of nodes. It's not that it's, it's a very simple leader selection process that is done in Rep Manager, where if a node fails, the rest of the nodes select a new leader, and that comes up as a new master, and the rest of the nodes start streaming from it uh, uh, continuously. Uh, the in interesting part was the multiple lines of defense we built against such failover scenario, not just at the uh, cluster level, but inside our application itself. 
So uh, the first line of defense is, of course, when such thing happens, the cluster itself, the rep manager itself, pushes a notification to all our application servers that, hey, your master node has changed. Figure out, uh, like, make sure you're writing to the correct one. Then the next level of uh, defense was, of course, all our applications uh, keep polling for the master. They keep, they keep checking, can I write to this master? Can I write to the master? Can I write to the master? The moment they say, I cannot write to the master, they try and they have a list of standbys. They can figure out which of these I can write to, and then they start writing to the new one. Because in our, in our cluster, only the master is writable. Rest all are uh, hot standbys, which are read only by default in uh, Postgres. Uh, the last uh, thing that we used, but we did was using ZFS instead of uh, uh, the regular file system on Ubuntu. Uh, ZFS allows us to have mirrors and incremental snapshots which can be backed up and recovered from very easily. Um, so the other side of the experimentation is where you measure things, right? Um, so we did, uh, we do most of our real-time measurement in Postgres, and what we feel is that Postgres has the sweet spot, right? That um, it's not great as a warehouse, it's not, say, as good as Redshift with months of data, but what it is good is that you give it 300 to 500 gigs of data, and it's really good at uh, pulling reports really fast in them. Um, but and, and, and another restriction that we had is that since we built it as a cluster and the database is streaming live from the master, uh, we have to use the same schema as the master. So we don't have a separating, separate, say, uh, reporting schema. What we did was change what's underneath. So uh, we configured a file system and the hardware to uh, read as fast as possible from disk. And that's what we essentially need for large queries. Um, and so we actually did end up doing a lot of uh, crazy Postgres optimizations, and you can come to us later for that. Um, and here's another parantu, is that um, maintenance is, is sometimes uh, definitely underestimated. With respect to Postgres, um, the reclamation of, like we do have a bird strategy in place in an ever-increasing DB, um, but the reclamation of space and reuse of space is still uh, sort of an unsolved problem for us. Um, and here's a shout out to the PostgreSQL community. We've gone loads of times to IRC on Freenode, and they've always given us answers and, or explanations. So Postgres provided us uh, with the real-time reports that we needed, but we still needed a way to uh, report on uh, historical data, like year and months of data that we have recorded so far in our uh, experimentation platform. So we we started we thought of using a real OLAP solution. Uh, so we tried Greenplum uh, as the OLAP solution uh, because again it was a cluster over uh, on top of Postgres. Uh, the loading reporting was pretty fast. Uh, it even had the upsert or the merge strategy, which most of the uh, OLAP solutions lack when loading the data into it. Uh, but again, it's not hosted and maintaining and standing up the cluster in Greenplum, at least to uh, untrained people like me, seemed very uh, uh, expensive. So we used, again, Amazon's Redshift. That's pretty well maintained by Amazon. And uh, the reason we used it, uh, used it was not only that. We already had other systems in our client's office which were using it, and we wanted to be able to report across systems again. So we went with the same data warehouse. Uh, uh, so, to move data from our system to the OLAP, uh, OLAP DB that we had, Redshift, we used, uh, our, we built an ETS service for it. The way it worked was we had events, uh, stream of events that our API sends out and writes to the disk, and that goes to S3. Those event, uh, uh, event, stream, event files are then uh, pulled from S3 using our ETL, uh, with a, ETL service pulls those things from S3. Uh, transforms them and loads them, loads them to uh, Redshift. All of them, uh, this was written as an assembly line uh, which was built using uh, core async. So this essentially sums up the entire ETL process that we had to do. Uh, and you can see, like, this is essentially all written in uh, core async. Core async gives you a thing called a pipeline which, uh, which has uh, one input channel, one output channel, and it takes a transducer, which transforms things from the input channel and puts them onto an output channel. So if you can imagine all these steps in the ETL process as different groups of people in a factory with an assembly line. So 
extract process is done by that many number and the second uh, second parameter to the pipeline is the how many threads you want to uh, run for that particular job so that many number of people in an SM, in a factory doing that job putting da extracting data uh, extracting data and putting into another another conveyor belt for the transform job to pick that up and start doing its thing so this is essentially uh, yeah an assembly line so um, apologies for coming to this so late in the talk, but we couldn't miss this. Um, well, I, I would say one of the most beautiful examples of closure was the previous slide. Um, but given that, let me go to this slide. Um, I guess most of this slide can be summed up to we really like closure, and uh, I really like Rich Hickey. Um, but uh, to be honest, like it really lets us focus on the actual problem. Um, we have not found us ourselves like trying to find out how something is implemented in Clojure. Um, it's really ex expressive, right? The assembly line, we'll show you a lot of examples ahead also. Um, and then we want to be on the JVM because we want to be fast and uh, we want the standard tools for debugging, profiling. Um, and it's also, uh, it was the established language of choice amongst uh, all the teams at Sparks and uh, we want to leverage the Clojure talent. And it's not that we couldn't have written this in, like, say, Scala or Go, um, but, like, say, we want uh, to be on the JVM, we want uh, a GC, and, like, we'd really like to spend a year learning Haskell, but we can't really afford that at the moment. So uh, here is, say, another example of such uh, of interesting expressive code. Uh, so if you remember the precise, messy architecture, this code sits, like, sort of critically in between that. So um, what it does, what, what this code is, is basically a map. On the left-hand side is um, a vector of the session tag and the type of experiment you're requesting for. And the right-hand side is how to bucket it, right? So I find that really expressive. And I've found people who came to our team and, and like started uh, ramping up on this ramp up pretty fast because of code like this. Um, wow. Even, OK. So this is the graph of how uh, we wanted to generate the report on the data we measure. So on top of this graph are the data, uh, are the things that are actually recorded in our DB. And uh, these are the computations we wanted to do to finally get to a, a value that is meaningful to our client, to report on, uh, to see in a report. So all this complicated graph maps onto closure in a beautiful way. So all the things you see on the left are uh, the nodes on the graph, and on the right is a very expressive way of saying how that value is calculated. Oh yeah, this is me. So uh, this is again another beautiful piece of code that, uh, code that uh, describes, says how uh, expressive closure is. This is a code of uh, defining a state machine in closure. Um, uh, a state machine in closure, and where each row defines the transition of, uh, of, of the system from one state to another. Uh, you, can imagine, you can imagine your uh, circles and arrows diagram that you draw in your automatic class sitting and drawing. This is essentially mapping of that onto closure in a very beautiful way. And we'll dig into this later when we go into simulation testing. Yeah, we'll dig into this later. Um, and that is probably another moment for a nice anecdote. Uh, or um, so. So one of the things that that we normally uh, try to um, like normally find ourselves failing with closure is really understanding its laziness. Uh, so in the absence of good practices for understanding laziness in closure, you can really um, mess up um, pretty bad. So for example, you run a function in the REPL and it doesn't run. And you're like why didn't that run? And then you'll be like, oh, it's lazy. That's why it didn't run. Uh, and so you have to like wrap it in, in, in a do block or something. And then um, say you're profiling something, right? And then your actual function doesn't show up in the profiler because it's lazy and it shows up somewhere else in a function that you wouldn't expect and that's bad. And um, the anecdote I was talking about was that um, we had an application cache and uh, we were putting things in it and we were putting uh, datomic datums. And one thing about datomic datums is that they have an index to the root of the database inside, the root of each of the four indexes. That means that it has um, 
a link to the entire database in every datum. And uh, we were putting datums in the cache, but we were like, that shouldn't blow up anything, but we were noticing that we were like going up to four gigs and then crashing in out of memory errors. Turns out that uh, we were uh, putting a lazy seek into the cache, and that's obviously very embarrassing, and we had to have Stuart Halloway come and fix it for us, but it's embarrassing, but it's true, right? So it's something you need to watch out for. Uh, back to this, as Abhinav was telling us the other day, the way to fix this would be to have some sort of engineering practice where you realize you see that every uh, layer of your architecture where your uh, data is going out of one layer to another, you realize your lazy seek and make sure that uh, there's no realization left between two layers of code where they don't know what they're getting, essentially. Um, so this is the uh, last part of our talk. So we built a system. Uh, we thought it was working because all our tests were passing, all our unit test integration tests were passing. But you don't really know that your system is working until it's working in production. And since this was such a critical piece of code for our client to be put on production, they want to be really sure how to be sure that your code will work in production. Simulation testing is one such tool which will help you get that. So what they do is it lets you simulate the working of your system with real usage patterns and varying degrees of load that you will actually see into production. So uh, we'll go into the detail of how it does that, how it uh, allows you to go through your realistic usage pattern. But uh, that is what we use to test it. So why test using simulation testing? Again, if you imagine your test pyramid where unit testing is on the low in the lowermost uh, part of the pyramid, and as you go up, there's integration tests, there's API level tests, there's your UI tests, there are your functional tests. Simulation testing sits on top of all of that because it is testing not the local parts of your application, but all of your application as a whole. And not just your application, but even if you want, systems of application that is integrating with your application, like a, a, a systems of all the subsystems, it can test as a whole. Um, Again, uh, other examples could be that humans can't, example-based testing, humans can't, humans can't possibly think of all the possible test cases. And then, so you go from example-based testing to property testing. So simulation testing would be property testing at the system level on the outside, not at the local uh, application level. Uh, the tools that we have used for simulation testing um, are simulant, causatum, and datomic. So we, uh, um, Simulant is a library in, in schema for developing uh, simulation-based tests, which is written and uh, maintained by Cognitech. Uh, it gives you abstractions like models, tests, and sims. Model is how you um, uh, model is essentially how you define uh, the different activities that happen in your system, and then based on the model, you define your test cases. Based on how what are the activities that can happen in your system, you define all your test cases which are again generated. You don't have to define one of them, each of them separately. And then uh, simulation is an instance of that test executed against your system. And again, uh, all, of, all of this we'll go into it in detail later. Causatim is the library we use to generate uh, streams of time-based events. And again, we'll go into the state machine that we give to Causatim after this. Uh, Datomic is the data store of choice because it works well with Simulant. So, um this is sort of borrowed from uh, Michael Nygut's talk in Strange Loop, which you should watch, and it's a great uh, explanation of the simulation testing tool that was used to build, that was used to test this exact system. Um, and I'll go through it a little briefly here. So um, what you have is your system under test, the big circle, and the simulation runner there. So these are the, like, the two main important parts in this thing. So what you have is the activity model, uh, so let's go through this from the top. Uh, so activity model is your state machine that describes uh, user patterns on staples.com, say. And you generate a bunch of events uh, from that state machine. So you're like, this is how a, like, um, like 100,000 users will behave on my system. And then you're going to like take this and give it to uh, the simulation runner. Um, and the simulation runner is going to run the same, but what it has to do first is establish state on the target system. Right, and you do that first. And once your target system is in an expected state, you run the sim. And when you're running the sim, um, 
you're going to record every single thing that happens in the sim. Um, and that, not in a log, but in a database, right? So you have, um, at the end of a sim, right, you have the system's output and the entire log of the sim inside the database, um, which you can then use to run validations. So uh, this is a state machine that Ned was explaining earlier, uh, and I'll go into it a bit in a bit detail here. So all these keywords that you see here are basically states that you can be in as, say, um, a staples.com user, right? So what you can do, you can log in, you can make a purchase, um, you can say go to some special page that I make a note of, and things like that, right? So all those things are your states, and each row in this thing represents a state transition. So you can go from uh, logging in to, like, say, a place where a promo is displayed. And the probability of this state transition is the third column. So you can say, what is the probability of this user going into that? And uh, the last two columns are like, um, so there, is, there are some real-time um, uh, constraints on how fast you can do two actions. So that is specified in the min delay. And the max delay is how, uh, like for example, if a session times out before you do something, you enforce that and say that your users have to behave this way. So that's like the max delay thing. So all these things are what uh, go into causatum and give you a list of uh, uh, an event stream that you can then use to test your target system. So uh, the event stream that Causatum generates is then, uh, e each of the event is then defined how, how that event will look like. So this is an example event, for example, here I'm asking my experimentation platform for give me treatment for some particular user. The important things to note here is it makes the request and then it records it. If it gets an exception, it records it. That's the important part. Whatever happens, it just records whatever happened and moves on. Because it's not asserting anything here. It's not waiting for some, some kind of re, uh, uh, special response from thing and then acting upon it. It's just recording everything and then moving on. Um, so this would be the, so imagine your simulation testing as sort of a, uh, you can compare simulation testing to functional programming in a way where you imagine the system under, under like the target system under testing which you're trying to test can be like imagined as a pure function. Pure function, not completely pure because it might have some state, but given a certain state, it should behave in the same manner. So you extract out the setting of state and the tearing down of state as an explicit step in your simulation. So before you run the simulation, you set up a certain state on your target system. You, in our case, it would be set up this merchant, set up this, these experiments for that merchant, and some business rules that we need for that particular merchant. Then you run the bunch of, uh, uh, the, the, the streams of events that you had generated, streams of activities that users can do on our system. And then you do it the tear down, where you say, okay, now I want the end state of your system. You, I gave you some state, I ran some simulation on you, and I want the end state, and I retrieve the reports. Then I run some uh, cleanup that I need to do to put the uh, system back into the state that it was. Um, and that brings us to how you actually write validations based on all the data you recorded. So like I said before, all the data, like the data that you get while running the simulation and the system state after is inside the database. So your validation is essentially a single query. In our case, because we use uh, Simulant and Datomic, our query is a simple data log query, uh, which looks somewhat like this. And say, if a simple um, validation would be to assert that there were no 500s during the entire sim, you can do that by just saying, like, uh, look at like the third line in. Sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, imagine like look, look at the third line in the query. That's basically like look for any action log with uh, an exception, and this assertion will fail if there were any such exception. Other examples of such validations could be that say um, I never assign two buckets of the same experiment to the same user, right? Or say, uh, if my traffic distribution is 60-40 between two buckets, I ensure that uh, at the end of my sim, and if I had, say, 1,000 users, 500 and 500 is the split. And, uh, or like with a certain error margin. And then you want to check that. So I can compute these reports, right? The, the reports that my uh, experimentation platform will generate. I can do that in the sim, in the simulation testing platform. And so I can compare that report and the actual report of the system and ensure that they match as well. So the simulation testing we used actually helped us get 
find some critical bugs in our system which were actually missed by our QA team and which were not bugs that were that we could uh, see it happening like we could see that. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, this gives us, because so you're recording everything that is happening in your system, right? You're not missing out anything. So you can run diagnostics on what happened, why things went wrong. So you found, we found a bug that, okay, I, I gave the, I gave uh, two buckets of the same experiment for the user. Why did this happen? What was the, what was the state of the system when this happened? So uh, in our, uh, in our simulation test, testing tool, this is a thing we, we run, say that print the timeline for the token. Token is the thing that uh, identifies a session. And it gives a result like this. This is a very cropped out, uh, uh, cropped out result of what the actual timeline looks like. So we can see that this is the, this is the post, it, at this time um, um, the session started. This is the time it took for uh, the sys target system to respond. At this point it did this uh, request. This is the time it took to respond. This is the response it gave. What was the status code and all of that. And you can this will help diagnose the actual problem that you found in your system. Um, um, and no, actually, I think this is you. Sorry. So uh, the all this is simulation testing again is really good, and we should definitely use it. But I would also like to point out a few things uh, that are hard to do. It's hard to maintain the simulation testing uh, tool that we like we have. For example, the tes the testing suite, whatever if you want to call it, uh, because you're test you're testing a cluster of systems. Right, every every system has moves at its own pace. Every yeah, there's so many moving parts that if one system changes its API, you need to make sure that your uh, simulation testing tool has been updated to to that. So we all we, so in the last one and a half years, we had one or two people from the team dedicated to maintain and make sure that the testing tool has been up to date uh, is is remaining up to date. Then again, the reason you run tests is to make it part of your development process, put it on CI. Uh, so imagine putting a unit test suite on CI for one service. That's easy. Imagine putting an integration test suite on CI. That's also easy. Imagine putting an end-to-end -end test. That's slightly hard. Imagine putting a browser test. That's also slightly hard. But all of that for n number of services that you're running. That becomes super hard. So when you we, we were actually trying to put the simulation testing uh, suite that we had on CI, and we I'm, I'm like sort of embarrassed to say that we couldn't, but it's 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 still in the process. We'll get there, and uh, then simulation testing can become part of your normal software develop, de delivery process, where every three hours a simulation test is run against your system to make sure that all of your systems are working in, in the manner that they should. Um, so in conclusion. Um, Traffic is precious, and that's, I think, the fourth time I've said it. Um, and so keep that in mind. It's not just us. It's not just Staples. It's Google. It's everyone you can think of who's doing experimentation. Uh, keep that in mind. Um, and then you can build assembly lines in Clojure really well, and you should probably use that. And ETL is uh, a good example of where you can use that. Um, so <laughs> thanks for that. Uh, and test your system from the outside, use simulation testing, um, and yes, use Clojure. And here are some really good uh, papers that, that we went through and books that we went through. Uh, these will remain on the slides and we'll put them up uh, somewhere. You can go through them later on. And that's it from us. Thanks. If you have any questions, we can take them now. Uh, so, okay. can you go to that slide? Maybe? Okay, sure. all right. We can we can take this offline. Okay. Thanks.